In this video tutorial, we're going to talk about service design. Before listening to this video, it would be helpful if you would listen to the product design video first. I'll put a link to that in the description. My students can access the video tutorials for these problems using the content menu in D2L. YouTube viewers can access the video tutorials on my MOOC on Udemy.com. I have a long and short version of the URL posted on the screen, and I will post this URL in the description. Service is an act. It's something you do to or for someone. You cut their hair. You cook their food. You give them a physical. In designing a service, you have to consider the service delivery system. This includes the facilities that it'll take to deliver the service, the processes involved in delivering the service, and the skills of the workers required to deliver the service. So if you were designing a restaurant, that would include what kind of a kitchen do you need? What kind of service area do you need? Are you going to use just all tables? Are you going to have booths? Are you going to have a bar? How are orders going to be placed? Is the server going to write them down and bring them back? Is she going to enter them into a point of sales machine? And what skills do the various people working in the restaurant need? As with my service example, it's important to remember as you design service delivery systems that many services are bundled with products, the restaurant and the food, for example. Service design includes one, the physical resources needed to deliver the service. That's what we talked about a moment ago. The goods that are to be purchased are consumed by the customer. I mentioned that a moment ago as well. That's the food at a restaurant, the drinks at a bar. Three, explicit services. That's what you're doing to or for the customer. Bringing them food, giving them a physical, bringing them drinks, cutting their hair. And four, the implicit service. With a haircut, for example, it's implied that you will look better after you leave the barber than before you came into the barber. With a nice restaurant, it's implied that you'll have a romantic atmosphere. These implicit services are very important in service design and unfortunately can be easily overlooked. Now for some terms. Service is something that is done to or for a customer. The service delivery system is the facility, processes, and skills needed to provide a service. The product bundle is the combination of goods and services provided to the customer. And there's not always something that's provided to the customer. There's not always a physical, tangible product involved. The service package is the physical resources needed to perform the service. These could be fairly minor, as in the case of a barber, or major, as in the case of a surgery. Now let's talk about the nature of services. 1. Everyone's a service expert. I may not know how to cook, and I don't, but I can tell you if I got a good meal at a restaurant or not. 2. There's no one best way to serve. Think about fast food restaurants. There are all kinds, producing hamburgers in all different ways. 3. Doing good work does not equal good service. The restaurant can cook you a nice meal, get it to you quickly, give you exactly what you ordered, but if you're looking to spend a slow, romantic afternoon with your lover, then they, they did good work, but they didn't give you the service you wanted. 4. Most services, like a restaurant, have some tangible element, like the food. It's not always the case. You don't necessarily leave with anything tangible when you visit the doctor. Your education doesn't really involve anything tangible other than a diploma at the end. 5. And this is just semantics. Services are experienced. Goods are consumed. 6. Managing a service is more difficult than managing a manufacturing facility. If you go to a car factory and ask them what they're going to be producing next Monday at 6.05 in the afternoon, they can tell you. They've got things planned out in that much detail. That allows them to schedule their suppliers very tightly to get exactly what they need when they need it. If you go into a restaurant and ask them what they're going to be doing in two hours, they don't know if they'll be full or empty or somewhere in between. Services often involve direct contact with the customer. In manufacturing, most of your customers are other manufacturers or other companies. It's only a handful of manufacturers that deal with consumers. Services, many of them, maybe even most of them, deal with consumers. Consumers are hard to deal with, as anybody who's worked in a service will tell you. And the more direct contact you have with those consumers, the more difficult it is to provide the service. We've talked about product design already, and I ask you to listen to that video before this one. Now let's talk about some differences between the two. These are generalities. There are exceptions to everything I'm going to tell you. Manufacturing is mostly about the tangibles. Services are mostly about the intangibles. Services are created and delivered at about the same time. So the restaurant is creating your meal a little bit ahead, but at about the same time they deliver it to you. This is a fancier way of saying you can't inventory services. A barber can't produce a bunch of haircuts ahead of time and hand them out during the busy time as customers come in wanting haircuts. That just wouldn't make sense. But a car manufacturer can do that. Most services are highly visible to the customer. And in fact, many services are produced in front of the customer. Services have a much lower barrier to entry. There is no way that me and my friends could get together and form a manufacturing plant to build cars. 
the capital requirements are just too large. The expertise is just too large. But we could probably get together and start a restaurant. Some restaurants, like a Subway, for example, have a very low barrier to entry. Location is not terribly important to most manufacturing. You can make it wherever you want to and ship it wherever it's needed. Because services interface directly with the consumer, services have to be located near the consumer. Here is relative. You'll drive further for a doctor than you would for a restaurant. But still, for a service, location is very important. There is a range of service systems that can produce and deliver many services, so you have to choose between them. Burger King and McDonald's, for example, produce their hamburgers differently, but they're both hamburgers. Demand for services is highly variable, much more variable than it is for manufacturing. Now, manufacturing certainly has seasonal demand, but that can be managed with inventory fairly well. You can't manage services with inventory, plus the demand itself is much more variable. Think about a McDonald's. If you go in there at 3 in the afternoon, it's fairly empty, not busy at all. Go in there at 12.15 and it's extremely busy. Speaking of that demand variability, there are two major approaches that services have for dealing with demand variability. One is waiting lines, which basically moves the demand into a period where you don't have as high demand. In other words, people have to wait until the service is free. And the other is to have higher capacity and then have idle time with your servers. Having waiting lines is more efficient for you, but more upsetting to your customers. So service design is about balancing those things. How much efficiency do you need to have in order to meet your customers' demands when they expect it? And how much can you have them wait so you can be more efficient? If your service has customer involvement, then you have customers with very different abilities, very different speeds, and so you're going to have to deal with that variability as well. Think about a buffet. A young customer might run around and get their food very quickly, free up those resources fairly quickly. An older customer would move slower, maybe think longer about what they're going to get, and tie up your resources for a much longer period of time to get the same or even less food. The more you try to build efficiency into your service, move away from a waiting lines toward efficiency, the more depersonalized your service appears. Some of the McDonald's near my house have put in tablets where you order from the tablet instead of a person. And in fact, the first time you interact with any employee is when you pick up your food. I'm sure that's extremely efficient for McDonald's, but it seems so very impersonal. Service design has five phases. The first phase is conceptualization. What is the service going to be? What kind of customers is it going to attract? Those kinds of issues. So let's say you've decided to develop a restaurant that specializes in lamb-based tacos. Two, identify service package components. And that's what you need to deliver the service. This could be a food truck where you don't need any seating at all, or it could be a fast food restaurant where you need minimal seating, or it could be a nice sit-down restaurant where you need a lot of seating. Depending on the volume you anticipate, your kitchen needs could be very different. Three, determine performance specifications. How quickly are you going to get the tacos to them? How quickly are you going to take their orders? Four, translate performance specifications into design specifications. Getting the tacos to them quickly is going to require different equipment than getting it to them slowly so they can enjoy the atmosphere. Five, translate design specifications into delivery specifications, such as at a fast food restaurant, we'll serve the meal within two minutes. There are nine characteristics of a well-designed service. One, it's consistent with the organizational mission. So, if the organizational mission is to serve reasonably priced food quickly, you're not going to have a fine dining restaurant with white table costs. Two, it's user-friendly. The customer can come into the service and immediately know how to use it. Many years ago, I was at a Taco Bell in Paducah, Kentucky, and they had set up a tablet system for you to place your orders. Now, this was years ago when computers weren't as common as it was now. Right in front of me was a couple, an elderly couple, and they could not figure out how to place the order. They simply couldn't figure it out at all, and there was no employee they could ask. It was not user-friendly at all. In fact, I ended up having to put their order in for them. Three, the system is robust. In other words, it can handle unusual circumstances. Many years ago, late at night, I was in a McDonald's. This was before the McCafe, well before the McCafe. The man in front of me ordered 20 cups of coffee, to go, of course. They had one coffee pot, so it was going to take him a while to make his 20 cups of coffee. They had one employee working a register, and their register was set up so that they couldn't close out and take the next order until they had completed that order. So I had to wait for him to get his 20 cups of coffee. They had to go through several coffee pots until they could take my order. That's not a robust system. He and I got to chatting, and he had a road crew up the road working on putting down asphalt, so he was buying the coffee to help them. Four, it's easy to sustain. You're not looking for a quick service. You're looking for one that hangs around and lasts a long time, so you've got to be able to sustain it. Five, it's cost-effective. If it's not cost-effective, you're not going to stay in business. Six, it adds value to the customers. 
Another way of saying that is the customer sees the value in your service. They're willing to pay the price you charge. So your restaurant delivers more value than what the items cost. Seven, effective linkages between back operations. So the back operations in a service are the things that are happening after you place your order, the things that you can't see necessarily. So if you go in a restaurant and you order a meal and you order something special, so you want your steak extremely rare, that linkage is when the order taker communicates that to the kitchen so that they can fix the meal the way the customer ordered it. Or you go into a hotel and you ask for a 6 a.m. wake-up call. The person booking you in has to put that into the computer, communicate it to the back office so you get your wake-up call. Eight, it has a single unifying theme. In other words, it's easy to describe as a hamburger joint or a nice restaurant or a car dealership. It can do a lot of things, but they're all related to each other. A number of years ago, McDonald's ran a test market for McPizza. Pizzas are produced very differently than hamburgers. People have different expectations about pizzas than they do hamburgers, and they often take a lot longer to fix. So it was outside of the unifying theme of McDonald's, and it didn't go well. Nine, you have a way of ensuring reliability and high quality. And again, high quality is relative. When McDonald's ensures that they have high quality, they're not talking about being an ultra-fine hamburger restaurant. They're talking about delivering the things that their customers expect from a McDonald's. Some of the challenges of service design include, one, variable requirements. This is a big one. If you've just had a fight with your girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, and you storm out of the house, go down the highway, and decide you're going to eat at McDonald's, you're in such a foul mood that there's nothing McDonald's can do to really make you happy with that meal. On the other hand, if you've just got a promotion at work, or you've just got good news, you stop at McDonald's on the way home to get a bite to eat, there's really nothing McDonald's can do to mess up that meal. Your state of mind determines the quality much more than what McDonald's does. Two, it can be difficult to describe some services. Not all, but think about a McDonald's again. And I do tend to use a lot of food examples. I've been referring to it as a hamburger joint or a fast food restaurant. But with the McCafe and the smoothies they do and the chickens sandwiches that they do, they're really much more than a hamburger joint. And it's really difficult to describe very succinctly what a McDonald's is. Three, high customer contact. I've alluded to this several times. The customers have variable requirements. I mentioned that. The service delivery people have variable abilities, and that just makes for a lot of difficulty. Oftentimes, it's even more difficult because the employees you're hiring are not highly skilled. Or the encounter between the service delivery mechanism and the customer. And in particular, if there's a mistake, is there a recovery mechanism? I'm going to briefly look at three contrasting service designs. One, production line approach. Two, self-service approach. And three, personal attention approach. These are not all of them by any stretch of the imagination. These are just three we're all familiar with, and they're good examples of service design approaches. The production line approach is where you treat delivery of the service as close to an assembly line as possible. In other words, you try to wring every drop of efficiency out of the service delivery mechanism that you can. You're trying to keep costs low, prices low, time low to get a large number of turnover. McDonald's is a perfect example of that. The self-service approach is where the customer performs as much of the service themselves as possible. And this cuts your labor costs, although it may increase your capital costs. Good examples are buffets, self-service gas stations, and automated teller machines. You have to be a little careful here. If the customer is producing too much of the service, they may start to wonder what they need you for. I've eaten at a couple of restaurants where they bring you the raw ingredients and you actually cook your own meals. I actually kind of wondered, what do I need y'all for? The personal attention approach is where the service provider provides a high degree of personal attention to the customer. This requires a lot more labor, generally requires more experience and therefore more expensive labor. So it's usually more expensive, but it can generate a large amount of customer loyalty. Nordstrom's is an example of this, as is that bar where everybody knows your name. So some guidelines for successful service design. One, have a good solid definition of the service package, and we've talked about what that is. Two, and this is something that is often overlooked, but two, focus on the customer's perspective. What is the customer going to think about your service? What are they going to see when they walk into your service? Three, consider the image of the service package. This is just more of focusing on the customer. What are they going to think about the service package? So in a restaurant, if the customer can see your kitchen, you have to design the kitchen to be seen. Four, recognize that the designer's perspective is different from the customer's perspective or the operator of the service's perspective. You can't necessarily just design something that looks good from a designer standpoint. It's got to look good from the customer's perspective, and it's got to run well from the service provider's perspective. Five, make sure that managers are involved to get that service provider perspective. 
Six, define quality for tangibles. That's the things that the customers can hold in their hands and the intangibles. It's hard to manage if you can't measure it. And it's hard to know if you've succeeded just by measuring it. You have to have a standard to compare the measurement against. Seven, make sure that recruitment, training, and rewards are consistent with the service expectations. So if your service expectations are high quality, don't reward based on speed. Eight, establish procedures for handling exceptions. This is incredibly important with services because of the high customer contact. There's always going to be misunderstandings between the customer and the service provider. You've got to have a way to deal with that that keeps the customer happy. It's much cheaper to spend some money to retain a customer than it is to obtain a new customer. Nine, establish systems to monitor service, service quality really, so that you know that you're delivering what you think you're delivering. Now let's look at some operation strategies for creating competitive advantages in services. Use packaging and auxiliary services to increase sales. This could be as simple as offering takeout meals at a nice restaurant. Use multiple use platforms. So with most fast food restaurants now, you can order in person, drive through, Uber Eats, their own app. Implement tactics that will achieve the benefits of high volume while satisfying customer needs for variety. Burger King is known for this, you're being able to special order your hamburgers. But you got to have systems in place that allow you to do that. Continually monitor products and services for small improvement opportunities. This is called incremental improvement or continuous improvement. Reduce the time it takes to get a new or redesigned product or service to the market. We talked about the steps that McDonald's goes through to design new products for its restaurants in, in the product design video. If you enjoyed this video, please click like and consider subscribing to this channel.